Passover time when Jews throughout the empire, from North Africa, from Rome, from Athens, from Ephesus, all came to Jerusalem to worship at the temple because the temple was many things, one of which is a house of prayer for all nations. But when Jews come at Passover time, they're also celebrating the Feast of Freedom. One can imagine how they felt, on the one hand, celebrating release from slavery, and on the other hand, recognizing that the city is under Roman domination. When Jews entered Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Freedom, Pilate brings his troops to Jerusalem to show to them Roman rule. We might think of Jesus' triumphal entry as, as a victory parade. The Greek term would be parousia, sometimes meaning second coming, but really a victory parade. When the enemies have been conquered, when the liberator has entered. So when Jesus enters Jerusalem at Passover time, we might think of this as a victory parade with a victory guaranteed, but not quite accomplished. But instead of a victory of dead bodies and booty, what we have instead is the victory of the cross and then the resurrection. The prophet Zechariah has multiple predictions about a messianic age, a glorious age, when God's rule is manifest on earth. Zechariah talks about a king, a son of David, entering Jerusalem humble and mounted on a donkey, a colt, a foal of an ass. So Jesus arranges to have a donkey ready for him. And when he enters the city, he enters it on the one hand as the son of David, a royal figure, a political figure. And on the other hand, he enters as a humble figure because what Jesus is concerned about is not political power in the sense of domination over. Jesus is concerned about what we would call today servant leadership, where the leaders are the servants of the people whom they lead. Using what's called poetic parallelism, the prophet Zechariah talks about this kingly figure, this messianic figure, entering Jerusalem on a donkey, the colt, the foal of an ass. And Matthew, who loves to footnote everything, says this is a fulfillment of Zechariah. And he quotes the passage and says, the people put their blankets on them and then Jesus sat thereon. Literalistic readers will conclude that Jesus is actually sitting on two donkeys, the foal and the coat itself, which, which sounds kind of awkward when you think about it. But there's no reason to read that literally. Jesus sat on the blankets that were put on the donkey. He's coming in as a leader and a servant leader. But this is a victory parade. It is not the circus. We typically talk about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem as happening on Palm Sunday. But that's a problem because if we look at the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there are no palms. They only show up in the Gospel of John. And palms are not a symbol of Passover. They're actually a symbol more of Sukkot, the festival of booze which happens in the fall, representing the time that Israel was in the wilderness. So what we learn from this is we don't mush all the gospels together. The early church said there are four different stories and we should pay attention to each because each of these triumphal entry stories has a detail or two which differs from all the others. Is it the crowd that hails Jesus or just his followers? Are there palms or are there royal blankets? Does Jesus come in in full fulfillment of the prophet Zechariah or are we left to fill in the prophecy on our own? When it comes to the Bible, particularly when it comes to the passion narrative, listen to each gospel story because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each have a separate story to tell. And only when we have that full panoply and then we read in our own concerns, only then can we fully appreciate the power of the passion narrative.
if we use our historical imagination, we can picture Jesus and his followers, not just 12 men, but women, other followers, uh, people he met in Bethany, people he met on the road to Jerusalem, entering the city. The crowd, or perhaps just the disciples, is calling out, Hosanna, save now. And some are calling out, Son of David. That's a political concern. Did Pilate know? Pilate, the Roman governor, who was in the city at Passover time to represent Roman strength and Roman domination. Did Caiaphas, the high priest, know? Because it's Caiaphas's job to keep the peace of Jerusalem. Is the crowd thinking a political savior has come? Is the crowd thinking that revolution is about to occur? Is the crowd thinking that God in all divine glory will enter the city, get rid of the Romans and create peace on earth? If I were Pilate, the Roman governor, or Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest, I would be very, very concerned about what the crowd is thinking. And that means it's our job because we can put ourselves in the position of that crowd. We're calling out, save now. We're crying out for the son of David. Are we thinking of political revolution or are we thinking of peace? Jesus enters Jerusalem, we hear the cry, Hosanna, from the Hebrew root for to save, the same root as Joshua or Hosea, or in Aramaic, Yeshu, or as we would say, Jesus. Save now, please. But we need to ask the next question, save from what? At Passover time, sometime in the early 30s of the Common Era, save us from Roman domination, from Roman taxation from Roman oppression, from the Romans trampling our holy city and our holy temple? Or are we thinking, save us now from disease, from poverty, from despair, from sin? From what are we calling out? Save us, please. And how do we think the son of David, this man entering into Jerusalem, what sort of salvation does he bring? Jesus enters the city. The crowd is there and the Romans are there as well. And Jesus is being hailed as a savior, a son of David. The gospel writers talk about the prophet Zechariah predicting the king entering the city, humble and mounted on a donkey. It's a fever pitch. But within a week, Jesus will die on the cross. What do we expect when the Savior enters the city? What do we expect when the victory parade is over? Why do our opinions change so quickly? And perhaps the triumphal entry scene might make us think, well, we've just installed a new minister. We've just elected a new governor. We've just set up a new system and it's wonderful. Can we stick with it? What happens in a week? when things change? Where is our fidelity? What do we do with the fickleness of the mob? Indeed, what do we do with our own expectations? Following the election, following the installation, following the victory parade. Where are we the next day? Are we just cleaning up the garbage that's left? Or are we ready to engage this new movement?